introduction and good afternoon everyone. Uh, I should say to begin with that I am looking for my slides, they are here. Um, you know, there is a very simple premise that provides some context to this talk. I'm going to talk a very tiny bit about technology, but really my interest is more in providing a context for one of the main problems that organizations face today. Our premise is very simple, it's the idea that all organizations have problems. Most, if not all of those problems concern people, and therefore applied psychology, the science of people in organizations, should provide helpful answers to the problems that organizations have. And I think, you know, clearly in the past 10-15 years we have seen an incredible explosion of exciting technological advances that can accelerate and scale up our ability to understand people, but we're still in the beginning of this revolution. And right now there's a big divide between uh, academic psychologists and other social scientists who are basically technophobic, they, they hate technology and have no interest in it, and they, and they even treat it as a fad. And on the other hand, um, you know, the technosexual community, us here, yeah, uh, who love technology, gadgets, innovation, but actually not necessarily have a lot of interest or respect for the science of people. So I'm going to try to very, you know, briefly or rapidly in this session bridge that divide. So can technology help us do this better? in the world of work. Um, great quote here by Stephen Hawking. He says, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. And I think this applies to much of uh, the um, kind of a field of talent management today. We keep on saying there's probably no bigger cliche phrase than the phrase, people are an organization's biggest asset. Right? You hear every business leader, every CEO, not just the HR professionals saying this. And yet, when you look at the reality for most employees, for most people at work, um, you know, the experience is far from positive. So to do this well, to start actually implementing some change that produces uh, both an improvement for organizations and an improvement for people, Note, they're not mutually exclusive, right? If people are happier, more productive, more engaged at work, organizations benefit because they beat their competitors. We need to start getting the basics right, okay? So one of the things that we rarely get, get right in uh, the practice of talent management is actually define what we mean by talent. And so since this is an interactive session, I will give you the first interactive activity now for you. If you have talent, please stand up. Okay, so talk about delusion, right? There's a very deluded audience. And, uh, uh, sit down, sit down. I, I'm going to ask the second question now. If you didn't stand up the first time, can you stand up now, please? Please. Okay, so there's one gentleman there, another one there. Just two people, three people, four people. Can you please, please remain standing, the four people who didn't stand up in the beginning, or five. Can we look at those people now? And can you tell me if you think they have talent? Yeah. Is there anything obviously untalented about them? I mean, we know that they are modest, right? That for sure we can infer. And modesty, of course, is a good requirement to avoid being self-deceived or deluded. You can sit down now, thank you. But one of the fundamental problems about talent is we cannot observe it directly. And the other one is most people are less talented than they think. You know, and you can't trust self-nominations of talent. Can you imagine if organizations determine the promotion of individuals based on self-nominations? Who here in the company thinks he could be the next CEO or he should be the next, you know, marketing director? Okay, a lot of you, so we have to make a decision, you know, so. And, and ironically, it is often the people who don't put themselves forward who are the ones that actually have, if not talent, at least the potential to develop talent because they are aware of their limitations. So this, I think, is very interesting and probably one of the only compelling and well-established conclusions of 50 or 60 years of psychology is people are not as good as they think, okay? And we prefer to think favorably of ourselves, even if it means being detached from reality than the reverse, which some people even call 
depressive realism or realistic depressive um, thinking. So what do we mean by talent actually? There's v multiple definitions, but the one that is the simplest and the one that I probably want you to take home with you today is the so-called law of the vital few. This is based on the well-known Pareto effect. Wilfredo Pareto, a sociologist from Italy, actually discovered pretty much by accident that the uh, peas in his garden yielded a very uneven distribution of crops. 20% accounted for 80% of the crops. And since then, this has been re replicated in any domain of performance. So in any organization, 20% of people or fewer will be responsible for 80% of productivity, profits, revenues, whatever you want to call it. Does this surprise you? It, uh, let me tell you, it's not a very popular uh, fact. It's not a very popular um, kind of a principle. Uh, most organizations have bought into alleged inclusive talent management practices where they would say, oh, we have to develop everybody. Oh, everybody's great in their own way. Oh, um, you know, everybody deserves the same attention. And first of all, that is not pro possible in a world of fi finite resources. And secondly, uh, the ROI will be um, very poor if you do this. So if we think about talent, the main challenge really is to measure performance well measure performance well, even if it's not an objective measure of performance, actually a valid, non-polluted, non-contaminated measure of performance. Once you can do that, you will see that there's a minority of people, and let me tell you, it is often fewer than 20%. It is often 10% that account for 90% of uh, performance. In the world of athletics, team sports, etc., this is very, very clear. In the world uh, of technology, this is clear. So, for example, one, you know, anybody can potentially become a YouTube sensation. We can all now upload something, a joke, or do something funny, sing a song, and potentially the barriers to entry to becoming a, a rock star or a YouTube sensation are very low. They've never been lower. Technology has democratized this. And yet, 1% of YouTube users account for 99% of traffic. Okay? Uh, so the better you can measure performance objectively, the more uneven the distribution are. And then all you have to do is actually study, observe the 1%, the 5%, the 10% to see what characteristics they have in common. We call that benchmarking or evaluating you know, your top performance. If you do that, then you can also improve, improve your ability to evaluate potential because you do it before it happens. What are the characteristics that drive talent in the future? So how can we measure talent? And the first thing, you know, there are really just two questions that we need to answer. The first question is, what do we mean by talent? What are these characteristics that the vital few, as opposed to the trivial many, have? And of course, you're thinking, well, it depends. Potential for what? Talent for what? Um, Roger Federer has talent for tennis, and Warren Buffett has talent for uh, finances. You wouldn't want to bet on Warren Buffett my, uh, winning Wimbledon. Probably not. And well, I was about to say, you wouldn't want Roger Federer managing your finances, but he's probably OK. So you know, there are probably worse, um, you know, worse uh, options for that. But so yes, uh, there are domain-specific skills, competencies, et cetera, that are important. But there are also some generic attributes or component of talent. We focus on three, ability, drive, and likability. Ability is not just domain-specific expertise, experience, and knowledge, but also general learning ability, learning potential, curiosity, good judgment. Drive is you know, very important, because if you hire people who are driven, you won't need to spend that much time and money motivating them. They'll motivate themselves. And likability should matter less than it does, but in a world where most, if not all, people's success depends on a single rating by their direct line manager, it matters to be likable. It matters to have EQ and to be rewarding to deal with. So this is a very simple model. And at the same time, it highlights um, the fact that talent and potential are very rare in most organizational settings. Think about it. Do you know many people who have ability, drive, and likability. I have to do this. If you have three out of three, please stand up now. 
suddenly nobody has talent in the room. We started enthusiastically, and now I, I push you to the other extreme. You know, reality is probably more in the middle, but this is, this is a fact, right? It's often the case that even high performers or people who are strive, uh, thriving in an organization, they might have two out of three. They might be smart and driven, but actually not very likable. They might be driven and likable, which compensates for them not being that smart. You know? So a rule is very simple. Three out of three will definitely make you a hypo. It should make you a hypo, even if um, your organization fails to see it. But they should see it, because it's pretty obvious if you're smart, hardworking, and likable. Two out of three um, probably gives you a job. One out of three probably means you are unemployed. Zero out of three, unemployable. If you are dim, lazy, and obnoxious, no coach can save you. Let me tell you that. Luckily, there's not that many people who have zero out of three either. You know? So these kind of complement and compensate each other nicely. So once we answer the what question, the next question we have to answer is the how. How do we assess ability, likability, and drive? And uh, you know, this really is um, an overview of, first of all, what I would call old school methods, like the interview, bio data, supervisory ratings, IQ tests, personality assessments, self-reports, resumes, 360s. I mean, these are old school methods because they've been around for four or five decades, if not more. And you can all get access access the slides later, so if you can't see or take pictures, don't worry, you will get them. And yet, for each of these old school methods, we have new tools that have appeared in the last 10 years. So for example, interviews. And you know, it, it's probably impossible still today to get any job without first going through an interview round. Um, at the same time, uh, that demand for interviews has um, has accelerated the application of technologies and computer-based algorithms to mining or making sense of interview data. So the market for digital interviews is booming today. Um, Biodata, uh, it's, it's, it's such an old-fashioned term that you might not have heard about it before, but really is the antecedent of big data. It was based on mining or compiling data from application banks and looking at things that are apparently not theoretically relevant or related. So it might be in, a, in an age that was less regulated, it might be your height, it might be your gender, uh, then it might be the time at which you filled in the application form and so forth. And then gamification, big area today, is just really a technologically enhanced version of simulations. Uh, most gamification, uh, game-based assessments are situational judgment tests, which have been around for many, many years. Why, is, I think, is this table important? Because if you want to do these things right, then consult all the evidence, all the scientific evidence that has accumulated over almost a century for the old school version of these tools. If you want to do gamification well, it helps to design your situational judgment tests correctly. If you want to do digital interviews well, it helps to know how to run and analyze data from an interview. So, and yet, um, you know, although there is this comparison and this binary world between old school and new school uh, tools or old school and technologically enhanced tools, really intuition is the number one currency. This is a lovely quote by Daniel Kahneman, the only psychologist to ever win a Nobel Prize. He won it for economics, of course, but towards the end of his scientific or academic career, he said, we're generally overconfident in our opinions, our impressions, and just so about everything, basically. You know. And yet, when you look at the world of assessment methods, even if you're evaluating or trying to evaluate the right thing, most likely you're not relying on any of these tools, old and new. You're relying on your intuition. You know? um, it, the area of psychology and any area that involves kind of a soft aspect of science, humanities, or social science is a double-edged sword, really. On the one hand, you know, it seems to be quite intuitive to understand people. On the other hand, we all overestimate how good we are at understanding people because you know, the, the apparent complexity is very low. Whereas if we were talking about uh, organic chemistry or astrophysics, you immediately would say, okay, I don't know anything about this. This is 
is complex. But there is a science to understanding people, much like there is a science to astrophysics or organic chemistry. So some of the new talent signals that have emerged that I think have the most potential, and I'm, go I'm going to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow in the closing keynote, um, on, um, which I entitled a Bitcoin for talent. So some of the ones that have potential, I mentioned video and voice profiling. You know, the main reason why this has so much potential is because uh, the baseline is so low. The average interview is a disaster in terms of its real reliability and validity. We know that very structured interviews can predict performance correlating with about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Nobody really conducts structured interviews in the real world of selection. And also, if you really want to do something structured, take the humans out of the equation. Just rely on computers and just rely on video voice capture and rely on algorithms to actually scrape the data. On average, a 20-minute digital interview will yield 80 million data points on an individual. Let me tell you right now that most, if not all, of the digital interview providers are actually not doing that much effective or extraordinary things with that data. All they're doing is playing the recorded interviews to the interviewer. So it's more uh, practical, cost-effective, and efficient for them to actually project their own bias vis-a-vis -vis a recorded interview. But we're, you know, we, there's still a lot of progress to be done. The same with voice. Some really interesting research showing that not looking at the content of conversations, but the physical properties of speech, you can get correlations around 0 0.3, 0 0.4 with performance, with um, KPIs and other revenue-related ROIs. And we can approximate uh, valid measures of personality by about 40%. Another interesting area, this is the area that has been researched the most, mining or scraping Facebook data, in particular Facebook likes. Anybody familiar with this research? No? You should consult the research by my colleague Michal Kozinski. He was very famous for the original uh, study that mined Facebook likes and correlated you know, machine learning algorithms of those likes with valid measures of personality and intelligence. And the number one finding there, or the, the one that caught the media's attention, was that in the US, um, the best single signal for having a high IQ score was liking curly fries on Facebook. You know. Why is this interesting? It's interesting because Nobody can provide, of course, a logical explanation of this. You know, what, what, clearly it's not causal. After the study got covered by the media, face, um, curly fries became one of the most liked things on groups on Facebook, which didn't raise the IQ of the nation. It actually didn't even make curly fries disappear as a signal for talent because the people who read the study understood it and then went and did it, you know, were not just streetwise, but also quite smart. But I think that's what's interesting about this new world of machine learning algorithms where technology either replaces or complements human judgment because we don't need theory to predict. Theory comes next, but if a prediction is stable and if uh, computers can identify valid unknown signals for talent or predictors of performance, they will add something that us humans can't. Now, it would be nice if we can learn something for, uh, out of that about the human nature, but it doesn't have to be the case for applied purposes. I think the area that will become most important and that is, to me, most promising is mining content and context from email conversation. Why? Because emails Everybody's been waiting for emails to go away for the last 10 years, but they're still with us. The average manager, I think, sends and receives about 1,000 emails a week in most places. So think about the richness of that data. And research has shown that, first of all, even if you ignore the content of email conversations, you can identify important patterns in the social networks that underpin the dynamics of organizations, who are the central people in the organization that others go for information, where or uh, through which individuals do ideas flow best, um, and mining the content of email conversations, you can link that to um, the three main indicators of potential that I mentioned, likability, 
um, ability and drive. So if we, if we solve the identification problem, the measurement problem, that still doesn't solve all the problems we have. We have to, of course, get better at motivating talent. Although, let me say this again, if you select the right people, you will have to spend a lot less time trying to motivate them, right? Does this make sense? Uh, ultimately, any selection assignment is about enhancing what we call person role fit, person organizational fit, and, you know, there might be several people here in the audience today who are lucky enough to be in a role or in a job that they're passionate for. And I think, I don't know if it's Confucius or everything these days is attributed to Confucius, the quote, choose a job you, li you like and you will never have to work in your life. You know, there is a truth about it that we have to remember. So do selection right and you don't, won't need to spend that much money on training and development. Typically, talent management budgets are reversed or inverted, 80% of the budget is spent on L&D, training, development intervention, especially at the top, 20% only in selection. It should be the other way around. So we know, you know, the science of motivation and performance at a very high level has concluded after decades of research that there are three main factors determining engagement. Um, which is the degree of enthusiasm and energy you put in your job or you devote to your job. And at a very generic level, you know, I think these make intuitive sense. So autonomy, hire people, again, um, for what they're good at and leave them alone. Don't micromanage them. If you micromanage them, even if they like what they do, they're going to hate you and they're going to try to go somewhere else. Mastery, let people achieve something let people perform beyond their expectations. Let people feel that they are doing something useful. Mastery is very important because most studies on engagement and performance assume that you engage people and then they perform. But actually, if you want to engage people, you can help them do their job better and then they will engage. So the causality goes both ways. And then purpose, employ people in meaning, meaningful jobs and roles. And this is where assessment plays a fundamental role because to understand the um, fundamentals of motivation or to do motivation well, you have to decode, decode the individual drivers or values that actually um, contribute to pur purpose in each person. You can't work at this generic level. So we have a framework and an assessment tool that does this. We call it the Motives, Values, and Preference Inventory. So we look at things such as, is the individual motivated by recognition? If so, they you will need to praise them a lot, make them feel special, give them a fancy title, the corner office. Is the individual motivated by power? If so, you better put them in a dominant, influential role when they, where they can drive team performance or other performance. Is the individual motivated by science? If that is the case, make sure that they can learn a lot on the job. And so, so one size does not fit all. This is also a cliche, but it is true when it comes to motivation. And if you think about it, the world of motivation has been equated to a very, very simplistic world of compensation when even when we talk about full or broad holistic compensation packages, it's all about commerce. We assume that the only driver in the world of work is commerce and that if you pay people appropriately and maybe not too much but also not too little, they will perform. And that is oversimplistic. You're looking at one factor, there are at least ten. Can talent be developed? And you know, here, you know, most people overestimate the impact that training and development interventions have. The most promising and optimistic um, finding here comes from the literature on executive coaching, coaching leaders that show that good, well-designed, uh, science-driven coaching interventions can boost leadership performance by about 30%. How do we measure this? Pre and post measures on 360 or team engagement, okay? So you know how engaged the leader's team is or the organization is. You know how the leader is rated on the 360. 
You coach them, that's the intervention, and then administer exactly the same measures afterwards. And if you do things properly, you boost performance by 30%. That is a lot, you know, that is a lot. Um, at the same time, some leaders are more coachable than others, so if you select leaders on their coachability, their openness to feedback, they will respond more. No intervention can work unless you increase self-awareness. You know, the little exercises we did in the beginning were devised or, um, you know, thought of to highlight this important issue. Um, Self-awareness is rare. It is critical uh, for any coaching intervention. We define self-awareness um, not as introspection, not as some kind of metaphysical quest to find your inner self. Usually at this stage I say, you don't have to go to India to find yourself, but since we are in India, that joke doesn't apply here, right? Um, so it's not about finding your inner self or who you really are. It's about understanding how other people see you. And that makes self-awareness a very tangible and concrete concept because all you need to do is, again, with good 360s, measure the distance between your self-views and other people's views in the beginning and after the coaching intervention. So good coaching interventions help people understand how they're seen by others. So much of the world, particularly in the Western world, is moving towards strengths-based coaching interventions. You know, this idea that you, you should only tell people good news. You should only focus on what you're doing well. And first of all, this is uh, totally illogical. You know, if you want to get better, you only get better by working on the things you're doing wrong or what your flaws and faults are. And secondly, um, if you accept that there is an unequal distribution of potential and talent in any organization, uh, pretending that everybody has the same strengths and the same talents, there is equally valuable, will actually be seen as unfair and annoy the people who are really good, your top contributors. So uh, it's a populist and maybe popular approach, but it's not science driven. There isn't, by the way, a single study, scientific study, that actually demonstrates that if you ignore flaws, faults, or weaknesses, coaching interventions are more effective. And even most people who adhere to the so-called strength-based paradigm tell you, oh, we also look at weaknesses. Well, then don't call it strength-based. You know, you're looking at the whole person. Um, we focus a lot on flaws at Hogan. You know, we focus on what we call the dark side of talent. We believe that the only way to get better is to help people understand what their potential derailers are, what their potential kind of shortcomings are. And again, we have a very simple but comprehensive model that looks at the main disruptive elements of an individual's personality. There are these 11 facets that we have here, from excitable to dutiful. Um, I, I like to refer to these as toxic assets. Because actually, there is an adaptive element to it. So for example, you know, if I am bold, which means I am entitled, arrogant, and overconfident, I probably will be able to fool others into thinking that I'm competent. I probably will be seen as charming and charismatic. But as this trait is reinforced, I am more likely to actually suffer making reckless decisions underscoring or underestimating the risks of a situation. So again, our goal with these derailers when we embed them in coaching interventions to actually improve a leader's performance is not to give you a personality transplant, not to turn you from like one extreme into the other, but to help you inhibit the worst aspects of your uh, personality or the worst aspects of you. And again, you can test for this very, very neatly. First of all, you put a leader through a 360 and our dark side inventory. You would typically see a strong correlation between some derailers and their 360s. So for example, a leader who's seen as excitable or volatile, the 360 will say that you know, they have a short fuse, that they pitch a fit very quickly, that they rapidly lose their temper. If you coach them, you won't turn them into the Dalai Lama, but actually you would at least help them inhibit certain behavioral reactions in certain contexts. You know, they might still be um, kind of volatile and grumpy at home or with their friends or in other contexts, but at least maybe you help them shout less 
or uh, pitch fear fits to their teams. And then you rerun the 360, not the personality assessment, and you will see, you know, much like Back to the Future when something changes in the past and the image of the photograph changes, you will see that the 360 scores improve. Why? Because they have been coached. So um, our view on development is it's quite superficial, really, because what we focus on is on what we call reputation management. This is the simple diagram that we use to frame or illustrate our, our, the Hogan coaching model. You know, we start by building awareness, and if you don't have the right tools, if you don't have a data-driven approach that actually tells people what the reality is and what they need to hear, not what they want to hear, then you target certain behaviors, then you hopefully change those behaviors, you sustain the changes, and then the idea is that people will start seeing you in a more favorable vein, in a more positive vein. You might be thinking, but did you really, really change inside you? The answer is, I don't care what's happening inside you, because perceptions are reality. If we crowdsource your reputation or ask the people who work with you, what they think of you and they have a better opinion, that's good enough, you know? But what if you're lying? What if you're cheating? What if you're putting up a repertoire, a fake version of you? If it works and it's nice, great. Much better than being the real you, but a grumpy, volatile person nobody wants to work with, you know? So perception is reality, and coaching really is about reputation management. So uh, if you want to know more about Hogan and what we do, I'll refer you to a little documentary that uh, we created a couple of years ago. The URL is thescienceofpersonality.com. And I think we have time maybe for one question or two questions, if they're fast. Just wanted to check with you that yep. have you faced certain challenges and how did you address that? Look, I think, I think there are uh, rational challenges, and it's good that these regulations are in place. Uh, it, be, it will be good if they apply to the world of marketing, for example. Uh, where all the data is being mined and it's the Wild West and there's very, very little protection in comparison. But I think it's good that HR will demand certain standards. Um, the, the simple answer is allow people to opt in. Let them opt in. Be transparent. Tell them why you're doing what you're doing. Explain to them that there is a benefit to them because you're going to know them better and put them in a role that is more relevant. And then if you want to opt in, you opt in. And if not, you don't. You know? So, um, yeah. Hello, Thomas. Uh, Darshna Ramachandran here. I'm from Tata Consultancy Services. Uh, this question is, I think, uh, relevant to almost all the organizations to identify how uh, a uh, candidate, although we do assessments, we gamify the assessments, but w what more can we do to see an, a candidate is culturally fit for the organization? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And so uh, we tend to focus a lot on the individual, but of course, in order to predict performance, you need to have the context. I talked about person role fit. If the organization can't provide an accurate measure of the culture, you can address this issue by benchmarking top performers. If you, if you look at the values of top performers, you're going to end up with a prescriptive model of what the right or most suitable values are for a candidate when you're considering them for a job. So it's no different than profiling for ability or personality. Great question. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thomas. Let's put our hands together Thank for a fabulous much. session.